have a lot of ATA dignitaries here this evening, and I can't take the time to introduce them all, but at least on my screen right below me is Jennifer Miller, Executive Director of ATA. She's the one that keeps us humming along, so we owe uh, her our thanks. Uh, I'd like to just um, call your attention to a couple of programs that we have coming up real soon. This Saturday, Tom Broadhead will be uh, presenting Navigating Del Comp. So if you attend that one, you'll be able to buy twice as much because you can shop on eBay and Del Comp then. So be sure and tune into that one. And then next Tuesday, we have Diane and Alan Bauer, who are experts on the philately of Eastern Europe. They're gonna take us on a fascinating journey of a hundred years of Eastern European history as shown in philately. So be sure and sign up for that one. And now I would like to introduce our speaker. It's kind of a cliche to say this person needs no introduction, but this is a person that is pretty much known to most of us. Wayne Youngblood is a prolific writer and editor who's been active in our hobby, very active in our hobby for many years. He's a past APS board member and he's taught APS summer seminar for over 30 years. He's received just about every major award that philately gives. But to us in ATA, he is our Wayne. He has been the editor of Topical Time for 11 years. We've won many awards with our journal um, and we uh, owe Wayne a debt of gratitude, not only for that, but for all of the many other volunteer things that he does for us. Uh, it's just fabulous. In 2020, Wayne received the ATA's highest award, Distinguished Topical Philatelist. So now I'm delighted to turn this program over to our Wayne. All righty. <clears throat> Thank you, Don. Uh, it's great to see everybody. I, I, it's funny, I'm so used to speaking to, to live audiences normally, and as much as I've done Zoom this past year, it's still never quite the same because I, I like to see people's expressions, I, and I like to, to move around with this and see, uh, it, it helps me with that. But nonetheless, uh, everybody's here. It's a wonderful thing. Um, I want to get started before we get into the slideshow part with a couple of uh, with eBay basics. Um, hopefully, if you're watching this, you have already registered for an eBay account and have one. <laughs> um, if you don't, it's not hard to do, uh, but eBay can be one of the most satisfying ways of finding uh, stamps, covers, and other goodies for your collection uh, out there. A couple of couple of very basics though um, that I wanted to cover is one is is bidding. Of course, once you find the things, there's bidding. There's all kinds of approaches, and that could be a, a subject for an entire talk on its own. Um, but I find Don had asked me about sniping at one point. Uh, now sniping is the practice of coming in at the last, very last second and uh, outbidding everybody else and having no time left for anyone to come back. And that's, it's a long-term practice in eBay. Um, there are actually software programs you can buy that will allow you to snipe. Uh, I don't own any of those, but what I do is if there are two basic practices that I have. Uh, is that if it's something that I really, really want, um, I'm not going to try to snipe and get it at the last second because somebody may still outbid me. Um, I will usually bid within a day or two of the end of the item uh, as much as I'm willing to spend on it. And if somebody outbids me, that's that's that. But um, you should always be be willing to pay what your what your your highest. Uh, idea is of what an item's worth before you ever bid, or at least have a good idea of what that is. Chances are very good if you're looking for unusual material, you know, what we call beyond the, the book or beyond the catalog items, which includes meters and, and postmarks, original artwork, proofs and essays and things like this, and you've not seen it before, chances are really good you're not going to see it again. Uh, so if it's something you really want, 
you know, feel free to bid generously. I, I you know, more often than not with some of my other uh, collections, <clears throat> I'll find there's there's an item I've never seen before. I'll bid maybe seventy five dollars on it. I may still get it for fourteen dollars, but but ha have a good idea of what it is, the highest amount that it's worth to you before you ever start bidding, uh, because it, bidding can become a fever and you can get carried away. It's happened to me before. Um, just a little word there. The other thing too is feedback. Um, both buyers and sellers rely very heavily on feedback. Um, and it doesn't have to be anything more than just simply great transaction, A plus or, or whatever. But in the feedback mode, um, dealers rely on, on having a, a large amount of feedback. And of course, um, dealers are much more comfortable dealing with buyers who have a large amount of positive feedback. Uh, but always keep in mind, even if you've not had a great experience before hitting that negative feedback button, that can't be undone once it's, once it's done. And um, I've seen people uh, flame a buyer or a seller, uh, regret it shortly afterwards, and there's nothing that can be done. And, and things quite frequently escalate from there. Um, so with that, and we can talk some general eBay afterwards, uh, but let's get into the, uh, <clears throat> into the program and we'll see if this is going to work just fine again. Um, Okay, are we up and running? Looks good, Wayne. Okay, great. So how do you find stuff on eBay? Uh, this is just, a, again, a quick guide to it. Um, there's, um, <clears throat> you can spend hours and hours, and I'm hoping maybe Don did last night after we talked, uh, <laughs> searching for things on eBay. You can, it, it can really become I mean, it's a lot of fun, first of all, whether you're you're buying things or not, uh, but just searching for things that that fit your interests um, and trying to to narrow it in on on razor point areas that that you may not have even thought of before uh, are, is a very very helpful thing. Um, so this with that this quick guide. Now, if you go to eBay at this point, there are currently more than 1.3 billion items listed on eBay. Now, this is, of course, all the different categories. Uh, but even if you filter everything out that's not a stamp, that still leaves you with 5.3 million listings. That's going to take you a little while to go through them all. Um, even if you filter all the other stamps out except for topicals, and you don't want to do that because there's lots of good stuff there, there's still 452,856, or as of yesterday, uh, listings. So how are you going to be able to find this stuff? It's not all that difficult, but again, as I mentioned before, it can become a, a huge rabbit hole, uh, one that I love going down. Now, it's important to, to always remember that those who are listing material, uh, they want you to find it just, just as much as you want to find it. You know, getting the two together, the buyer and the seller, uh, is, is where the magic happens. Uh, but also, it's important to remember that most everyone who's, because it, it generally costs to list on eBay as well as the, uh, the final value fees. Uh, many people list items only in a single category, even though they may, may fit two or three. So uh, one of my main collecting areas is, well, I've got multiples, but one of my favorite collecting areas is playing cards on stamps. Um, and so it may be a topical, it may be a playing card revenue, uh, it may be a playing card on a postcard, uh, any number of different categories that an item could go into, but a seller generally is only going to have it in one, in one category. So I need to know how to search for it. So your biggest, your best toolbox, of course, is, is the search button. And you'll find that you go to ebay.com, you get up to the main page, and here's search for anything right here. Now the default is the all category search. And you can do that if you have a very esoteric topic such as platypuses on stamps or something like this, uh, you can go right into that and, and let it bring everything up. It's not going to bring up that much for those, but you know, if you collect something more 
popular, such as aircraft or um, you know things like that, it may bring up tens of thousands of items across all the categories, as well as partial words that that may blend into this, and so it becomes completely unworkable. So my default is to always start with the drop down menu. Now you can see this has all categories. There's a drop down menu right right next to it. So if you are, if in this case, I'm looking for playing card, use the drop down menu, bring it down to stamps, and hit your search, and it'll now bring up everything that's that's there for playing card. <clears throat> now, at this point, it did bring me 697 different results under stamps alone. Now, to narrow that down, you can see at the top of this, we have um, several playing card revenue lots that are up at the top. While I enjoy the revenues, that's not necessarily what I'm looking for. So I'm going to want to narrow things down. So over at the far left side, you've got United States, Europe, you've got topical, Canada, and a, there's another drop down for more and that would show other areas of, of the uh, world that would have uh, playing card stamps on them. We're going, to, we're going to ignore everything except for stamps right at the moment. Uh, if I hit each one, any one of those, it will provide another drop down menu within that category. So if I hit topical stamps, it's going to show me another drop down with those stamps that are listed uh, under under topicals in the countries. Now, another area that is really, really helpful if you want to broaden your search a little bit, I'm into, I'm going to, uh, you saw I had uh, several hundred results for playing card. Another thing that people do is they, they will often mention something in the description that they don't in the headline. The default setting in your search when you hit playing card is only going to bring up those things that appear in the subject headline. So if you now click include description, which is found just below and to the right of the drop down menu, that's going to find anything with the words playing card mentioned in the description in the stamp category. So if it's a one playing card stamp within a larger set of, of stamps, and it's not mentioned in the headline, this is going to bring those things up. And most of us who collect topicals um, will find there's maybe one stamp, an entire set that has what we want to see on it. And so this, including the description, is, is an extremely helpful part of it. But again, you can see by the results that come back, it does broaden the search some, but you can often just simply scroll down and, and, and eliminate a lot of that. Uh, but that is an important part of the search. Now, another part of it, another thing is the advanced search. Um, and if you go this, this just below my headline up here, you'll see uh, I have playing card in the subject line. Uh, depending on how you have your view screen set up here, um, if you go past the stamps and clear over to the right, there's a little button you can hit for advanced search. And I won't spend much time on that right now because again, this is one of those rabbit holes you can go down. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, but at that point, that opens up a whole new screen. And now you can enter specific keywords, the catalog number. Uh, there's a drop down menu to find other things. You can exclude words, uh, certain words in there that you don't want to see. You can again bring it into the category of stamps, postcards, collectibles, whatever you want to do. Um, and you can include title and description. If you want to see what things <coughs> have been in the past, although sometimes you'll find something that's already sold, it's, it's sometimes less painful to not look there. But you can also see completed listings and sold listings. Um, if you want to limit your budget, you can see items, you can limit the, the search to only things priced from you know a dollar to 49.99 or whatever you wish uh, and so on there's the, the, the screen goes down further there's all the, there's all kinds of different options you can use with the advanced search function and again that's found up at the top screen uh, main screen next to your main search beyond the categories and to the right uh, far to the right Now, one of the best tools you can possibly have is save this search. Uh, once you've found any search that works, uh, right below your search 
button, there's this little heart that says save the search. You hit that, it goes into saved searches. eBay will email you every time something comes up that meets the criteria that you had in your search box. Um, so what I find frequently is that if I'm looking for one particular type of item, um, I may refine that search in three or four different areas where it's much more specific and save each one of those searches. So uh, in my own search uh, menu, I have probably uh, six or seven different playing card related searches um, just because they're much more specific. But, but saving that search allows you to allows you to have eBay contact you anytime something comes up uh, that matches the criteria that you typed into your your search box up top. Uh, this shows some of a few of my own searches here. And you can see I've got a huge variety of different things. Um, and again, I, I find it best if you have not already established an eBay account, or even if you have, uh, you may want to switch it over. I find it best to keep all of my eBay activity in its own uh, email, at its own email address uh, for all buying and selling for searches, because that way, if you get any amount of email, um, the eBay material can can. I hate to use the word junk it up, but it can it can confuse things quickly. Um, it's, it's much easier to be able to just go into your eBay uh, email and check out what you've got there. Now, eBay used to limit the number of searches you could have to 100. Um, they're, they're not specific with how many they allow you to have now, uh, but based on conversations with other people and with some of the eBay uh, officials, it's a minimum of 150 and sometimes over 200. I don't know how they determine this, uh, but you, you know, you can just keep saving searches until eBay tells you you can't, and then you've got to eliminate some. <laughs> but you can figure you've got at least between 150 and 200 uh, searches possible, which is probably more than most people need or want anyway. Uh, but managing your eBay search page, which is under your under your my eBay tab going down uh, on the right, and we can look at this with the live shot later. Uh, you can have you can see saved searches. This is a screen that will come up, so you can see again some of my searches here. Uh, and you have the it tells you what the search is. It tells you what the search criteria is. So. Uh, in this case, the Bugs Bunny, the third one down, Bugs Bunny stamp sheet matted pane. That's exactly the search criteria that I entered in for this particular search. Um, and so that's as it is, unless I change it. Now, it shows you what's there. If I no longer need that search, I can click delete, whoopsies, <laughs> and, it, and it goes away. Um, you, can, uh, you can edit your search. Uh, one of the buttons to the right, you can edit your search and change the search criteria. Um, you can unsubscribe uh, from emails, meaning that you still have the search, but you don't necessarily have it um, actively emailing you every day. Um, so it's a, it's a good page to manage. Now, we'll look uh, briefly at a few problems, potential problems that you can have with searches. Now, I, one of my other areas is I happen to like peppers on stamps, and you can see a few of them here uh, on these stamps. However, if I do a general eBay search for peppers on stamps, uh, I also get clawed pepper, which you can see here, black pepper, Dr. Pepper, uh, and others coming up that kind of junk up my search. Um, so. I need to be able to uh, limit those searches a, a bit. Uh, so to do that, in this case, I enter in uh, chili peppers on stamps. But in this, but well, before we go there, I went to topical. If you just click on, click on topical, it did take me to that, got, got rid of Dr. Pepper, got rid of Claude Pepper and such, and got into all the topical listings. Now, under that topical listing, I mentioned the subheads earlier. You can see nature and plants, and that's the only subhead here. Although some of the topical, if you do horses or aircraft or things like that, you may have several different drop downs from there. 
Uh, the other thing that's important to note at this point, and again, you won't find it with every topic, but it is there for some, is as you scroll down, you can look at regions. I don't care about what region. If, if it comes, you know, if the sellers in Trinidad and Tobago, fine. Uh, or if they're in Sri Lanka, that's fine by me too. But you can search for postage. You can search for individuals. You can search for souvenir sheets. This means that there are items listed that way. In this case, you can even see there's a proof and essay, but there's only one listing for it. So if I were to check that box, um, then it would take to that very specific listing. Um, and again, if you're looking for things like proofs and essays, original art, uh, pictorial postmarks, meters, anything unusual, providing the seller has, has checked that material in there that will come up and gives you the option to find those specific items. Uh, postcards are another great area to go for. Now, uh, if you exhibit, postcards are not, you can't really uh, use them extensively, uh, but in terms of adding to my own mounted pages and such, postcards picturing things that I like, like peppers um, are, are a wonderful thing to, to add to it. Uh, but in addition to that, a lot of times you'll, you'll find good philatelic material on the back side of the postcard. So don't, don't neglect postcards as, um, as a category, because even if you're not looking at the front side, you may very well find things on the back. And of course, for things like maximum cards, uh, postcards, there's a lot of maximum cards that come up in postcard listings that are not listed in stamps. Again, this is one of the other things you want to remember is, is if you limit all your searches for stamps, you're going to miss a lot of good material that's out there in other categories. Now, eBay does self-correct certain searches at this point. They didn't used to. So in this case, uh, chili pepper, which is, is what I had to use to get rid of Claude Pepper and Dr. Pepper and things like this. Uh, but it also brings up the spelling C-H-I-L-I -I, as in the red hot chili peppers, uh, or even uh, spelling of double L-I, which is uh, used in the Ukraine apparently, but it, uh, or as a misspelling. Uh, but it did bring up these items, which it wouldn't have done that several years ago. So it does self-correct uh, some of the spelling errors, which actually aids the seller in, in uh, helping to find you as a buyer. Uh, but that being said, don't neglect uh, intentional mis misspellings too. Like for example, in my playing card thing, in this case, I typed in playing crad instead of card and brought up this wonderful listing of an invert. Now, this is where some bargains can really be found sometimes, because if, if a seller has listed something and, and spelled it improperly and it doesn't show up, this wouldn't show up, it did not show up in my playing card search, but by intentionally misspelling it in the search function and bringing it up, nobody else is going to see this. And unless they happen to think about bidding on it, uh, chances are good I would get it for the minimum bid if I, if I wanted it is you're going to have far less competition on items that are misspelled than you will if you have properly done one. So what I do, and I'm not going to show a lot of examples of this, but what I'll frequently do is for those things that, you know, a lot of us have stone fingers at times, uh, both listing and, and otherwise. So for the topics that I use, like in this case, playing crad, uh, I would also use praying card, uh, any number of different spelling variations. Um, and I don't save these searches typically, but uh, I keep a list of them so that if I'm going to spend some time searching for things, I type these in. And generally, when you, when you hit gold on these, only one or two uh, items will show up, but that's all you need if you if you're finding something that's really unusual or something that's uh, that's been misspelled this way. So don't mis don't neglect misspellings on uh, on items. It's a it can be a wonderful resource as well. Now, also be careful uh, that you're when you look for things because there may be errors in listings too. This particular one came up in my chili pepper search and indeed it says USA Bear Creek 1998 event canceled chili and he's used all three spellings of chili pepper and vegetable cuisine and all this kind of stuff and indeed it looks like some bell peppers here but by actually reading the cancellation it says Hart's Pumpkin Festival 
So th those aren't peppers, they're pumpkins. Um, and so even when you find things in searches, obviously the, the, the lister, the sellers make mistakes occasionally too. Uh, but at first glance, if I hadn't read this carefully, I, thought, I would have thought, great, bell peppers in the cancel, these are a winner, they go right in. And I would have been disappointed when I got it. That's the, uh, the end of the, uh, the actual slide program here. Now we'll, we'll take some questions and we'll go into a live search in a moment. Um, but I want again, I want to thank uh, everybody for, for coming and, and uh, we definitely have some time to, uh, to look at a few other things. So with that, I'm going to exit out of here.